This DVD is a companion to the book Monitoring Tigers and Their Prey, edited by K. Ullas Karant and James D. Nichols. The DVD and the book must be used together to learn the techniques correctly. Copies of the book and the DVD can be obtained from Center for Wildlife Studies, Bangalore, India. Admin at wcsindia.org To effectively conserve tigers in the wild, it is important to be able to reliably estimate and monitor their numbers. This will tell us whether tiger populations in various reserves are going up, going down or holding steady. Since tiger numbers are generally closely linked to the availability of prey, monitoring tigers also involves reliably estimating the numbers of prey animals in a forest. This video guide illustrates modern scientific techniques for monitoring wild tigers and their prey. Since it is impossible to count each and every animal in a forest, attempting total counts or censuses of wild animals is usually impractical. The scientific techniques described here are based on well-tested sampling methods which can provide reliable results if used correctly. For estimating the number of prey animals in a reserve, the method that is recommended here is known as line transect sampling. Line transect sampling is conducted by two field workers per transect and involves the use of simple instruments like binoculars, range finders and compasses. For estimating tiger numbers in a reserve, the technique recommended here is known as camera trap sampling. Camera trap sampling involves setting up automatic cameras on paths and trails used by tigers. The cameras are triggered when tigers pass by, resulting in clear photographs. Since each tiger has a unique stripe pattern, the photographs can be used to identify individual tigers. The capture histories of these individuals are then analyzed using a method known as capture-recapture sampling to estimate tiger numbers reliably. Line transect sampling and camera trapping are however time-consuming, manpower intensive and expensive and therefore generally only appropriate for use in relatively small areas such as a tiger reserve, wildlife sanctuary or national park. For monitoring and surveying larger landscapes such as entire countries, states or regions, good baseline data on presence of tigers and their prey can be generated using a simple method known as occupancy sampling. The chapters in this DVD deal with the field protocols involved in each of these methods. Details on the statistical basis for these methods can be obtained by reading the source manual Monitoring Tigers and Their Prey, edited by K. Ullas Karant and James D. Nichols. The forests of Asia are home to one of the most endangered mammals on Earth the tiger. Every year, large amounts of money and manpower are invested for the conservation of the species. But how can we tell if these investments are working? Only through monitoring if tiger populations are going up, going down or holding steady. This training video will demonstrate modern, scientific methods for monitoring tigers and their prey. Monitoring tigers is by no means easy, for they are secretive predators that are rarely seen, except in a few reserves where some tigers have become habituated to tourism. A majority of tigers lead solitary, hidden lives in thick jungle, 
and are often nocturnal in their habits. How then do we keep track of their numbers? Since tigers don't live in communities, we can't simply go from cave to cave and conduct a census. Fortunately, there are other ways, and biologists like Dr. Ullas Karant of the Wildlife Conservation Society have developed reliable, scientific methods for estimating tiger numbers. If these methods are followed meticulously, it is possible to keep track of tiger populations. However, even the best methods should not be practiced blindly. To produce reliable results, they have to be combined with a basic knowledge of tiger biology, such as how much space do tigers need? What kind of habitat do they prefer? What do they eat and how much? One important fact is that there is a direct correlation between the number of prey animals in a forest and the number of tigers the forest can support. Each adult tiger needs about 3,000 kilograms of live prey every year. They need large-sized prey and lots of it. To survive, a tiger needs to kill about 50 to 60 deer-sized prey animals per year. So, for every single tiger in a forest, there needs to be a population of at least 500 prey animals that produce a surplus of 50 animals for the tiger to eat each year. Therefore, counting the number of prey animals in a forest will give us a rough idea of how many tigers the forest can support. That's why monitoring tiger numbers also involves counting the number of prey animals in a forest. But this is easier said than done, as prey animals are alert and elusive. Often they live in thick jungle and are not easily seen. Therefore, animal censuses through direct counts do not work in forested landscapes. We can only estimate animal numbers, and to do this reliably, we need to use well-tested sampling techniques. Here is how the sampling method works for estimating prey animals in a forest. If we take a sample area of forest and thoroughly count the number of prey animals in it, we can extrapolate this information to estimate the number of prey animals in the entire forest. However, this is complicated by the fact that forests often have different types of habitats with differing concentrations of herbivores. For instance, one part of a forest may have a high density of prey animals and another part could have a low density of prey animals. If we only sample the low density area and extrapolate this information to the entire forest, then we will end up underestimating the number of animals. On the other hand, if we sample only the high density area and extrapolate that information to the entire forest, we will end up with an overestimate. So, to get a reliable overall estimate, it is necessary to sample from all the representative habitats. There is one more factor to keep in mind. Even within the area that we sample, it is impossible to count all the animals that are present. Because in a forest, some of the animals are seen, and some remain hidden. So only a certain proportion of the total number of animals present can be detected by us, while others go unseen. This is why we need to use sampling techniques. The scientific technique described in the next chapter is one of the reliable methods for sampling prey species. One of the best methods of sampling prey species is through a technique known as line transect sampling. A line transect is a straight line through a forest on which observers walk to count animals on both sides of the line. 
The technique involves not only counting the numbers of animals seen, but also measuring their perpendicular distance from the transect line. Transects can be simple straight lines that go from point A to point B, or they can take the shape of squares or triangles. The advantage of a triangle or a square is that the field workers come back to the same point where they started. This makes logistics easy, as people have to be dropped and picked up at transects. When designing line transect surveys, it is important to ensure that transects are situated at random with relation to the distribution of animals. If transects are deliberately situated along water holes or salt licks, we will end up with an overestimate. For more information on this, please refer to chapters 9 and 10 of the manual. Line transect sampling can be accomplished using volunteers and wildlife staff, but only after they have been trained properly. Field workers should be trained in the concept and practice of sampling by an expert. In addition to theoretical training, a short stint of field training too is necessary with an experienced instructor. Apart from learning the correct techniques, it is imperative that field workers are able to correctly identify the prey species they encounter. In Asian forests, these might be gaur, sambar, spotted deer, wild pig and muntjac. As we saw earlier, because of trees, bushes and shrubs in a forest, some animals will be seen and others will go unseen. This is not a problem for estimation. However, it is vital that the animals that are seen are counted carefully and the distance from the observer to the animals is measured accurately. In line transect sampling, all animals that are on the line or immediately adjacent to it are detected. But as the distance increases from the transect line, the detectability of animals gets reduced due to vegetation or because animals often blend in with the background. Factors like these are taken into consideration in the scientific calculations that will be used later. Before observers can walk on a transect line, the line must first be marked through the habitat. The line must be straight and can be indicated with the use of red paint on trees. It is important that the observers are able to see the line at all times. The vegetation must not be disturbed too much or cut unnecessarily as that may alter the results of the sample. It is sufficient if there is just enough space for the observers to walk silently in single file. Walking on a transect line needs care. As far as possible, the observers must see the animals before the animals see them. If the animals scatter before they can be detected, it is of no use. So, the observers must wear camouflaged clothes and walk silently through the habitat. Proper footwear is essential for walking in the jungle. Extra protection for the legs can help prevent ticks or leeches from getting on. The trousers on shirt or jacket must help the observer blend with the surroundings. A few items of equipment are also required. Binoculars for identifying animals clearly and making accurate counts. 
a range finder to measure the distance from the observer to the animals, a compass, and of course one needs a data sheet to note down the observations. Walking on a transect needs care and practice. The team should consist of only two people. They should walk silently and at a uniform pace of 1.5 to 2 kilometers an hour. They should remain alert for observing prey animals. The person walking in front scans the area right ahead. The person walking behind scans the area not covered by the first person. When any animals are spotted, the observers quickly identify and count the animals and measure the distance to the animals using the range finder. It is crucial to measure the exact distance of the animals from the transect line. Any mistakes made will alter the results of the estimate. Since we usually see animals well before we come abreast of them, Measuring perpendicular distance from the transect line needs a special technique. That's why one observer also carries a compass. After measuring the observer to animal distance, a compass reading of the animal's position in relation to the transect line should be taken. The measured distance and the angle will enable us to calculate the perpendicular distance later. Please note that when there is a group of animals present, the measurement should always be made to the center of the group or herd. Please also note that if the animals have moved since they were first spotted, the measurement should always be taken to the point where the animals were first spotted and not to the new position. All data, such as number of animals for each sighting, distance from the observer, and the compass bearing must be noted down meticulously in the data sheet before the observers move on. The observers must not linger watching the animals, but must move on as soon as they have collected these data. The best time to walk on a transect line is during early morning and late afternoon hours when prey animals are most active. The best time of the year for transect surveys is during the dry season, when the forest is most open and visibility is good. It is even better after a few rain showers, so that the leaf litter does not make too much noise while walking. A transect is usually 3 to 4 kilometers in length. In some cases, a transect may have to be walked repeatedly to get proper estimates. It may not be enough to walk on a transect line just once. It is extremely important to have as many transects as possible to sample the entire habitat. An ideal number would be between 20 to 40 transects. All data that are collected in the field are analyzed in a computer software program known as Distance. This software takes in raw data and generates prey animal density estimates. In summary, the following points must be remembered. Line transect sampling helps us estimate the number of prey animals in a large forest area. The objectives in a line transect survey are to identify prey species, count the number of animals encountered at each sighting, and measure their distance from the observer standing on the transect line. Since animals are often seen before we come abreast of them, two measurements must be taken with every sighting, the distance from the animals to the observers and the angle. These two measurements will later enable us to calculate the perpendicular distance. Whenever there is a group of animals, the distance measurement must always be made to the center of the group. If the animals have moved from the time they were first spotted, the measurement should be made to the place where they were first spotted and not to the new position. All measurements must be accurate and they must be noted down correctly in the data sheet.
Once the counting and measuring is done, the observers must immediately carry on. While on a transect, silence should be maintained. Smoking is strictly prohibited. The observers must walk at an even pace of 1.5 to 2 kilometers per hour. Only animals that are seen and correctly identified must be counted. Since there are dangerous animals in Asian forests, field workers must take appropriate common sense precautions while walking on transect lines. For more information, please refer to chapters 9 and 10 of the manual Monitoring Tigers and Their Prey by K. Ullas Karant and James D. Nichols. In the last chapter, we saw how the line transect method is used for estimating the numbers of prey animals in a forest and how it can work well for animals that can be seen, identified and counted and the distance from the transect line to the animals can be measured with a range finder. However, this method does not work with tigers because they are shy and secretive animals that avoid humans. Tigers are generally solitary, nocturnal and not easily seen, so the chances of encountering them on line transects are very low. Therefore, we have to employ other methods to estimate their numbers. If we could identify the tigers in a forest individually, it would be easier to keep track of their numbers. For many decades, people have tried to do this through studying tracings of tiger footprints. But this pug mark method of identifying tigers has proved to be highly inaccurate and ineffective. There is a far better way of identifying individual tigers from differences in their stripes. Although all tigers may look alike superficially, a closer look will reveal that each tiger has a stripe pattern that is as unique as human fingerprints. Therefore, with clear photographs, we can distinguish individual tigers accurately. However, it is possible to get clear photographs only in a few parks where some wild tigers have become habituated to the presence of humans. In most areas where tigers live, they are rarely seen clearly and cannot be photographed for identification purposes using conventional photographic techniques. Therefore, the best way to photograph tigers for identification is by using automatic cameras triggered by the tigers themselves. This method of capturing tigers is known as camera trapping. Camera trapping involves finding parts and trails used by tigers and setting up automatic cameras to photograph them as they pass by. At each camera trap location, the trap consists of two cameras, one on either side of the path to photograph both flanks of passing tigers. The cameras are linked by a transmitter that transmits an infrared beam and a receiver that receives the beam. The camera trap is set at the correct height for tigers. Once it is set, a tiger or other large animal walking through the invisible beam takes its own picture. Since each tiger has a unique stripe pattern, Distinguishing individual tigers from the photographs is easy. Here are two pictures of tigers photographed with camera traps. We might think that they are of the same tiger, but if we examine the photographs carefully, we can easily see the difference in the stripe patterns and thus establish beyond a doubt that they are two different tigers. We can take any section of a tiger's body and use it for identification. Even if we manage to capture only a portion of a tiger, identification is still possible. However, when comparing photographs of tigers, it is best to compare the same portion of the body, preferably the flanks, where there is minimum distortion of the stripes. Broadside pictures 
also sometimes enable us to distinguish whether a tiger is a male or a female. To make a definitive identification of individual tigers, it is necessary to have photographs of both sides of the body. This is because the stripes on either side of the body are different. Once a tiger has been photographed from both sides, the two sides must be linked together and the tiger must be given a unique identification number. To photograph tigers simultaneously from both sides, a camera trapping unit must always consist of two cameras set on either side of a path or trail used by tigers. The cameras should be set at a height of 45 centimeters for tigers and all loose wires must be carefully hidden from view. Camera trapping tigers using automatic cameras is not difficult. But how do we use these photographs to estimate the total number of tigers in a forest? How can we know what proportion of tigers were captured among all those present in the area? Once again, we must use a sampling method. This method is known as capture-recapture sampling. This involves repeatedly photographing the tigers in an area in a number of samples and finding out what proportion of tigers are recaptured in subsequent samples. Analysis of such capture-recapture histories of individual tigers using special software will enable us to estimate the total population of tigers in the area. To understand this concept better, please refer to Chapter 11 of the manual. Sampling a tiger population in a vast forest using camera traps requires a good camera trap survey design. There are four main points to remember. Point number one. The camera traps must not be placed randomly in the habitat, but must be carefully positioned at spots that are most likely to be visited by tigers. This requires field craft and knowledge of tiger behavior. Skilled trackers can be very helpful in detecting areas with good tiger movement. Within their territories, tigers walk on well-established trails. They often visit areas where there are salt licks or water holes that attract prey animals. Tigers also love to walk on man-made roads in the forest. If camera traps are intelligently placed on trails and roads used by tigers, the chances of photo trapping tigers will be greatly improved. Point number two. The placement of cameras must be designed in such a way that every tiger in the area has a good chance of being photographed. Point number three. The goal should be to catch as many individuals as possible in each sample and to recapture as many of the same tigers as possible in subsequent samples. In order to ensure this, a large number of camera traps should be spread out sufficiently and in numerous locations. It is not enough to use just a few pairs of camera traps. Point number four. For the results to be meaningful, camera trapping should only be conducted for a relatively short duration, say, 30 to 60 days or so. To understand why, please refer to chapters 11 and 12 of the manual. Before undertaking camera trapping in an unfamiliar area, it is necessary to first do a survey to identify the best locations to set up cameras. Good trap sites can be a place where several game trails converge. A trail leading to a water hole or a kill. An area where tiger signs are evident, such as pug marks, scats, scrape marks, or scratch marks on trees. Camera trapping is best done during the driest season of the year, when logistics are easy and cameras can stay dry. Where cameras need to be protected from rain, elephants or thieves, a secure metal housing is ideal. There are many types of camera traps available 
and one must use the most appropriate one for a particular situation and to suit one's budget. The camera trapping schedule should be arranged in such a way that all cameras are set up and checked as frequently as possible. To make identification certain, all camera traps must have two cameras to photograph both sides of the tiger. Care should be taken to position the cameras properly and the cameras should be tested regularly to make sure they work. The lens should be kept clean to get clear pictures. Meticulous record keeping is a must for successful camera trapping surveys. It is of utmost importance that relevant data is recorded on the photographs and that the two photographs taken from either side are linked together as the same tiger. The location of the camera trap should be clearly recorded in data forms. Proper camera trap data sheets must be used to record all the information. Film canisters or digital photos must be clearly numbered so that each photo can be specifically linked to a location and date of capture. The negatives should be checked thoroughly to ensure that no roll goes unprocessed and no frame goes unprinted. When identifying tigers from photos, use the same body portion and compare it to all earlier tigers in long-term studies. For more details on the concept and practice of camera trapping, please refer to chapters 11, 12 and 13 of the manual Monitoring Tigers and Their Prey by K. Ullas Karant and James D. Nichols. In the previous chapters, we saw how line transect sampling is used to estimate prey animal numbers from direct visual sightings. We also saw how tiger numbers can be estimated through capture-recapture sampling using camera traps. These intensive sampling methods work well in areas that are relatively small, such as a single national park or reserve. However, it may not be practical to use these techniques over larger landscapes such as entire countries or large regions within a country as it will require too much money, manpower and equipment. For example, line transect sampling requires a lot of skilled effort to get adequate observations. Thousands of kilometers of transects may have to be walked by field workers trained in the use of instruments such as rangefinder and compass. It is not easy to find a large number of people with such skills. Camera trapping not only requires skilled manpower, but also involves the deployment of a large number of cameras. Therefore, using these techniques for an entire region or country becomes an impractically expensive and time-consuming exercise. Further, in some regions, tigers or prey animals may occur at very low densities. In such situations, acquiring adequate samples of visual detections or photographic captures might require far too much effort for which resources may not be available. How then can we reliably assess the status of tigers or prey animal populations over large landscapes and regions? We can do this by using a method known as occupancy sampling. The focus of occupancy sampling is not to find out how many animals there are in a large landscape, but to determine where the animals are distributed over that landscape. The main objective in an occupancy survey is to find out what proportion of the landscape is actually occupied by the animals being surveyed. Is 10% of the habitat occupied, 20% or 90%? In conducting occupancy surveys, it is not necessary for field workers to actually see prey animals or tigers. 
or to capture them in camera traps. It is enough if they detect and record the signs that are left behind by these animals. As animals go about their daily activities, they generate lots of signs such as tracks, dung or scats. It is easier to detect such signs than to see the animals themselves. This is particularly true of areas with low animal densities. Detection of animal signs does not require advanced equipment or technical skills and can be accomplished even by people with only basic field skills. So, how do we conduct an occupancy survey? For example, if we wanted to do a tiger occupancy survey across the entire state of Karnataka in South India, how would we go about it? Here is how. First, we take a map of the region. Over this map, we superimpose land cover information to help us eliminate areas that clearly cannot support tigers. What remains on the map now are just the forested areas where tigers might occur. Then, we superimpose a grid consisting of equal sized cells of about 200 square kilometers each. Next, we eliminate some more cells in which the forest remaining is either too small or unsuitable for tigers to live in. At the end of this elimination round, we will be left with the actual number of grid cells to conduct the survey. But how do we arrive at the appropriate size of grid cells? Why use a 200 square kilometer cell in the case of tigers in Karnataka? For occupancy surveys, the size of each cell should be greater than the largest possible home range of the animal being surveyed. In Karnataka forests, the average home range of a female tiger is about 50 square kilometers. The home range of an adult male tiger in the same landscape, however, is typically three times larger. Therefore, tiger occupancy surveys in this landscape should use a cell size of about 200 square kilometers. Once the cell sizes have been determined for the landscape, and grids are imprinted on a map of the area, the occupancy survey can begin. Each survey team typically consists of two to four field workers. As mentioned earlier, it is not necessary for field workers to actually see tigers or to camera trap them. It is enough if they detect and record the signs that are left behind by them. It is important that survey teams search each cell for animal signs according to a predetermined survey design. They should not walk around the habitat at random. The survey route is divided into segments of equal length, which are known as replicates. Each type of tiger sign is recorded only once per segment. For instance, even if several scats or several sets of tracks are found in a segment, they should be recorded just once. The field workers should be able to identify tracks and scats of tigers accurately. Whenever a tiger sign is encountered, the location of the sign should be recorded using a handheld GPS unit. If a GPS unit is not available, one can use a map and compass technique for recording the location. A proper occupancy survey data form should be used for noting down the observations. The field workers should cover the entire cell following the route specified in the survey design. They should use their common sense to work their way around obstacles such as rivers, swamps and other logistical constraints. The field teams must focus their search for signs around locations where signs are most likely to be found. Waterholes, game trails and forest roads are some examples of such locations. 
Apart from detecting and recording signs, field workers should also collect photographic evidence of tracks for later verification. They should collect scat samples as per the prescribed survey protocol. Please note that it is possible that some signs that are present in a cell may go undetected. Not detecting any signs could mean either that the tigers are not present in the area or that they are there but were not detected during the survey. Therefore, as with line transect and camera trap sampling methods discussed in earlier chapters, occupancy surveys also involve the issue of detectability. This issue of detectability is dealt with during analysis using information from replicates. Once all the cells on the map have been walked, a clear picture will emerge of the proportion of habitat occupied by tigers in the entire landscape. Not only will the data tell us where tigers are present, but we will also be able to determine which areas are used intensively and which areas are used sparsely. So, the three key questions that habitat occupancy surveys answer are 1. What proportion of the habitat in the overall landscape is occupied? 2. How does the intensity of habitat use vary across the landscape? And 3. How does occupancy in a large landscape vary over time? Occupancy surveys, if conducted once every few years, provide valuable information for tiger conservation. They can tell us whether new populations are getting established and whether habitat used by animals is shrinking or expanding. If our conservation and management efforts are successful, in the long run, the proportion of occupied habitat can be expected to increase. If conservation efforts fail, this proportion will decline. Cell sizes will change depending on the species being assessed. It is essential, therefore, that some information about expected home range sizes of the animals being surveyed is available and that it is incorporated into the survey design. In the earlier example of a tiger occupancy survey, we had taken the cell size to be 200 square kilometers. That is because the maximum home range for tigers in the example area Karnataka is known to be 150 square kilometers. But in the case of a prey species like the muntjac, which has a home range of only about 3 square kilometers, a much smaller cell size, say about 5 square kilometers, will need to be used. For larger prey animals like gaur, the cell sizes can be 15 square kilometers. In summary, occupancy surveys allow us to monitor the status of tigers and their prey at large landscape scales, such as entire countries or large regions within a country. The main goal of an occupancy survey is not to find out how many animals there are in a landscape, but to determine where those animals are distributed in the landscape. Occupancy surveys help us determine what proportion of the landscape is occupied by tigers and their prey. Occupancy surveys do not require advanced equipment or technical skills. They can be done by people with basic field skills. During occupancy surveys, it is not necessary for field workers to actually see the animals or capture them in camera traps. It is enough if they detect and record the signs left behind by animals such as tracks, dung and scats. It is very important that field workers are able to correctly identify the signs. They should photograph the signs for later verification by a supervisor and collect scats as per the scat collection protocol given to them. All signs should be recorded on appropriate occupancy survey data forms. Grid cell sizes should be determined according to the animal being surveyed. 
Tiger occupancy surveys will need large cell sizes. Prey occupancy surveys, on the other hand, require smaller cell sizes. In order to determine grid cell sizes, some information on expected home range sizes of the animals being surveyed is essential. When walking within a cell, field workers should follow a predetermined survey route. They should not walk at random in the habitat. The survey route is divided into equal length segments that are considered to be replicates and each type of animal sign is recorded only once per segment. Field workers should search for signs in the most likely places such as salt licks, water holes, game trails and forest roads. Whenever signs are encountered, the location of the signs should be recorded with the help of a handheld GPS unit. When a GPS unit is not available, one can use a map and compass technique for recording the location. For more information about occupancy surveys and sampling, please refer to chapters 4, 5 and 6 of the manual, Monitoring Tigers and Their Prey by K. Ullas Karanth and James D. Nichols as well as the occupancy survey designs provided separately.